Hello GCSE historians and welcome to today's lesson. Now we're going to start off with a bit of revision, revising what we learned last lesson and some of our key exam techniques. Now in the medicine paper there is a four mark question which will compare two different periods and it will ask you to explain one way in which they were either similar or different. Now because it's only four marks it doesn't need to be very long. Okay, We're going to be four minutes. We're going to make sure the answer is kept brief and we're going to make sure that we definitely compare the two periods. So let's have a look at our example here. Our question is explain one way in which ideas about the treatment of disease were different in the 17th century from ideas in the 13th century. So we're looking for a difference in treatment. And we're looking at 13th century, so that's the medieval period, and the 17th century, so that's the Renaissance. So how was treatment different in the medieval period to the Renaissance? Now, structure it. You're going to have three sentences here. Firstly, you need to identify the difference. So here you can see that it says XXX, so that would be our difference, was different because in the 13th century they did this, but in the 17th century they did this. So it should sound something like treatment was different because in the 13th century they did da da da, but in the 17th century da da da. So, now can you think of some different forms of treatment? 13th to 17th centuries. One that immediately springs to mind for me is transference. That's new in the 17th century, isn't it? The idea that if I lie beside a sheep, a disease will go into the sheep. Or how about new world treatments, okay, new herbs and spices being brought over from the new world. Uh, tobacco would be a good one. So could you now try and answer me this question? Use the italicised um, sentence starters, three sentences. I'd recommend leaving a line in between each to help your examiner see where you first of all identify the difference and then you back it up with evidence from what it was like in the 13th century and evidence from what it was like in the 17th century. Don't spend any longer than five minutes doing this. Off you go. Okay, so now I'd like you to have a look at this image. Where is it? Can you tell what city this man is rowing through? Hopefully there you can see in the background we've got the dome of St Paul's Cathedral. So we're in London. He's riding there on the River Thames and what can you see in the water? We've got filth, rats. Not quite sure what it all is, but it does not look good. The air looks quite polluted, doesn't it? And who is the figure rowing on the Thames? He's deaf. So, what is this referring to? It's referring to the outbreak of epidemic disease, which was particularly bad in the capital city, London, in the industrial period. Now check out this modern photograph. Today we're going to be looking at one of the most, well, one of the largest killers in the industrial period, smallpox. We're going to work out what smallpox was 
and how they developed the first treatment, well not the treatment, sorry, prevention for it. So, how did they prevent so many deaths against a great, horrible disease like smallpox? Well, you probably have not really heard of smallpox, but I'm sure you have all heard of chickenpox. You've probably had it at some point in your life. And it's not a very nice disease, is it? Um, you tend to get it when you're little, and you get lots of red sort of sores on your skin. You feel rubbish, you have flu-like symptoms. The funny thing about getting chicken pox is that once you've caught it you won't ever get it again. Now that's because if you catch a disease your body creates special cells called antibodies and you use these to fight off infections. So as long as you survive the infection your body learns how to fight it in the future. That makes you immune to further attacks of that disease. Now being immune means you can't get it again. So this is what we're hoping for with COVID, isn't it? That we'll all become immune. Now the fact some people survived several epidemics of the plague or smallpox was accepted by people throughout history, even though they couldn't explain why it happened. And this practical knowledge led to a procedure called inoculation. Inoculation was first developed in China, spread through Asia, into Russia, and eventually made it to Britain. Now, inoculation is essentially giving yourself the disease. So what they do is they would catch a mild dose of disease so that later on they wouldn't get a really nasty form of the disease that would kill them. So they would have built up enough immunity to survive if the nasty form of the disease came through. So in the industrial period, they had special physicians who got a lot of money by inoculating people, by charging them to inoculate. What these physicians would do is that they would make a small scratch on the patient and then they would rub in a bit of pus from a smallpox victim. That gives the patient a mild dose of smallpox, which they hopefully recover from, and then they're immune. Now, it's not a particularly precise procedure, so sometimes an inoculation did actually kill you. Mm, bad luck. However, it was generally seen as the best way to ensure you did survive smallpox. So it became really quite popular, and especially because we had some really important people start to inoculate themselves. For example, Catherine the Great, um, the Tsar of Russia, the leader of Russia, she got all her children inoculated in 1768. And in Britain, there was one doctor Thomas Dinsdale, who became really famous for his inoculations, and he got really rich off it as well. He was made a baron, and he was paid £10,000, which, remember, in the industrial period would have been a lot, and he got an annual salary of £500. So lots and lots of money could be made by these physicians who did the inoculations. That will be important later, remember that. Now, because these doctors charged to inoculate, it meant that not everybody could get it. You had to be rich in order to pay. And, like I say, not always effective and safe. So, we're going to start off by making some notes now on inoculation. I'd like you to read page 84 of your textbook and then complete these tasks here. Just so you know, by the way, that's an image of Catherine the Great. So 
fantastic. So now we know one way they tried to prevent smallpox. I'd like you now to watch this class clips video to learn about the new procedure, which was created by Edward Jenner. Now here is Edward Jenner. He was a country physician and he wasn't a big fan of inoculation. He gathered lots of evidence to prove that, do you know what, a lot of times inoculation was a failure. He was, however, a good scientist, or rather he had a science eye, because out in the country he noticed that those dairymaids who caught cowpox never seemed to get smallpox. He decided there must be a link between cowpox and smallpox, which he needed to investigate further. This is where Edward Jenner becomes a bit morally dubious, because he decides he's going to test his theory out on a little boy called James Phipps. So, firstly, he infects James with some cowpox, and James recovers, and then... Jenna goes back to him, and this time he infects him with smallpox. Luckily for James, he didn't catch the smallpox. So Jenna says, right, clearly cowpox makes you immune to smallpox. And he starts to repeat his experiment on lots of local people. And then he writes up his findings in a book called An Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the variola vaccine. So this is the moment we first get vaccinations in history. Now the word vaccine actually comes from the Latin vax or cow. I guess you can see why it comes out of this experiment to do with cowpox. So a really important breakthrough. I think especially these days with Covid we understand how important it is to vaccinate ourselves so that we are preventing disease from spreading. Because that's better than treatment, isn't it? If we just never get the disease in the first place. I'd like you now to use page 84 and 85 to complete this, um, this slide here, which looks at the different factors which led to Jenner's development of the vaccination. So, how did he communicate his ideas? How did he use scientific thinking to develop it? And what role did the government have in promoting and spreading the idea of vaccinations? Now take a look at this image. The great 18th century print. What can you see happening to these people who have just had the vaccination? They seem to be turning into cows or some kind of horrible animal, don't they? So what is the message of this cartoon? Why has it been made? Well, what we're looking at here is the first bit of anti-vax propaganda. So. Jenner's vaccine was amazing. It was going to stop the biggest killer of the industrial period. You had lots of people, just like you have today, saying, I'm not having a vaccine, I don't know what's in it. So there was lots of opposition to his vaccination. Some people said, because it came from cows, it went against God to be mixing man and cow. Those inoculators who'd made lots of money try to discredit Jenner's uh, theory because Jenner, like a nice person, was doing it all for free. So they weren't going to make any money anymore. Luckily, however, the government did support Jenner and so his vaccination programme um, was spread out across the country, indeed across the globe, because Napoleon starts using it in France. And today, vaccination has now been compulsory in most places, and we've pretty much eradicated smallpox.
shows you how good vaccines are. So now I'd like you to complete this table. We've got three different elements we're looking for. So we want some notes on the good points about Jenner's work, the reasons why there was opposition to his work, and any outside events that affected his work. Lastly today, have a look at this question. Now this is a 12 mark question, so it's asking you for three key paragraphs. The question is, explain why there was rapid change in the prevention of smallpox after 1798. Now there are two bullet points you can use, but you have to add on your, a third from your own knowledge. So you could use inoculation as one of your paragraphs, and you could use the government as another. What else could you use? Have a go writing up your three P paragraphs and submit it to your teacher.